Hello. In this video, I'm going to walk through how to read a regression table in political science. To summarize, your focus should be on determining which results are statistically significant and what sign those results have. Before we dive into regression tables, though, I wanted to note that you'll find many types of tables and graphs in political science research articles. The first tables are in fact not usually regression tables, but will provide some kind of summary statistics. For example, this table is from an article on voter turnout in the Arab world, and it provides information on the surveys they used, including the number of people sampled in those surveys and what the actual percentage turnout figures were. To give another example, uh, this table and figure are from a survey done in Afghanistan on the relationship between American assistance programs and attacks against international forces. The table provides you information on where the surveys were conducted and how many people were included. It also gives you basic information on how many violent attacks there were in each area. For surveys, you typically want to know more information about the demographics of the people involved. And that's what this figure provides. It gives information on the average age, uh, education level, and income of the people surveyed. Often, uh, oftentimes this information can be conveyed in a graph as well. These two graphs are from a study on the long-term impact on, of the slave trade on social trust in Africa. And here they provide you information on the number of people involved and the regions using uh, a map. So even without delving into the regression tables, you can still find a lot of really useful information from the figures in the article. But we're here to learn about regression tables. This is a very typical table that you'll see in many types of articles. This happens to be a research article on uh, whether countries with an Islamic tradition are more or less likely to be democratic. The first thing that you want to understand from a table like this is what the variables involved are and which ones were studied in comparison to each other mathematically. The dependent variable doesn't usually show up in the table itself. It won't be listed under a column called variables. To find the dependent variable or effect that we're interested in, you typically need to read the title of the table. Here, the title is Regressions of Freedom House Scores on Hypothesized Determinants. Determinants just means independent and control variables. And you will often see regressions uh, referred to in this way. So a regression of the dependent variable on the independent variable. Again, in political science, we talk about effect before cause sometimes. So that's where we see the dependent variable here, which is a Freedom House score. It's a measure of democracy. Your independent and control variables will be found in the column on the left. The independent variable you're primarily interested in will typically be the first one listed. In general, uh, you can ignore the constant. It does often have a meaning, but it's not something we're interested in here. So looking to the first variable, Islamic religious tradition is the primary independent variable or proposed cause in this study. But we have to take into consideration a bunch of other potential causes of democracy and rule them out if you want to say that Islam's an important factor. So these are the control variables and they are listed after your primary variable of interest. The last thing I wanted you to notice here are the models. Regression tables will always have a series of columns of numbers. And you'll notice that not all columns have the same number of numbers, the same number of results. Uh, some are, are missing gaps in the middle, some only cover a couple at the top. What a model is, it's, it's a different version of the equation that the scholar is using to run this regression analysis. So in model one, he compared all the variables to each other. But in model five, he only compared religious tradition and economic development to each other. It only had two variables. The reason why scholars do this and put this in their table is to demonstrate that, hey, look, even if I control for more variables, even if I add more things into the equation, you can still the effect, see the effect that I'm talking about. The next thing that you wanna take a look at in a regression table is statistical significance. To review from the previous video, while there are three ways to measure statistical significance, usually uh, authors only report two in these tables, standard error and p-values. 
Here, when you read the small text down at the bottom of the table, you can see that it says standard errors are in parentheses. This is extremely common. So underneath the coefficients, the results that we see for each variable, and you read these across the row, each of them has a standard error associated with them. The standard error for the coefficient 1.24 is 0.27. Here, the standard error for economic performance is 0.05. Standard errors, uh, because you know you have to double them compared to the coefficients, are often not the easiest way to determine statistical significance by glancing at a table. And that's why people report p-values. You can see here, um, again, there's a notation at the end of the table showing that one asterisk, or one star, we usually say, next to a result uh, indicates a p-value of less than 0.05. Two stars and three stars mean an even smaller p-value. Again, our standard here is, is it more or less than 0.05? Less than 0.05 is good. That's statistically significant. That's what we want to see. So what you need to look here is not how many stars there are next to a result, but whether there are stars or not. Any result that has any star next to it is statistically significant and one that you want to take a closer look at. All the results without stars next to them are not statistically significant. We can't tell the difference between those results, those numbers, and zero. Finally, we take a look at the actual coefficients, the actual results that come out of the regression themselves. Uh, again, to remind you, a coefficient is a mathematical representation of what the independent effect of a particular variable on the dependent variable is. Since we can't tell the difference between coefficients that aren't statistically significant and zero, there's no need to interpret or look at those very much at all, except to note that uh, we don't see communist heritage or British colonial heritage having much of an impact on democracy. The results that are statistically significant here, though, are Islamic religious tradition, economic development, and OPEC membership. Each of these coefficients has a star after it. All I want you to understand beyond that is whether the results are positive, as in the case of economic development, or negative, as in the case of Islamic religious tradition. Here what this is saying is that countries that have an Islamic religious tradition are less likely to be democracies that, than countries that do not have an Islamic religious tradition. That's what a negative relationship is. Or conversely, Countries that have higher levels of economic development are more likely to be democracies or to have higher levels of democracy. That's what this positive coefficient here means. The last thing you can note on these tables is the n, the number of countries that were studied in this research. What's most important here is the overall size of the number. In general, bigger n's are better than smaller n's. You want to have as big a study as possible if you're gonna do statistics. And you also want to see whether the number of cases studies is consistent across all the versions of the equation. This final example is from a table we'll read when we read about uh, the role of ethnic conflict in civil war. Here again, you can see the dependent variable, civil war onset, in the title of the table, and the independent variables listed in the first column. I wanted to show you this version of the table because it has a couple things that are different from other uh, tables I've shown you. First, it talks about logit analysis instead of just regression analysis. Logit is a specific type of regression that's interpret di interpreted differently than linear regression. Uh, since we're just looking at the sign and significance of results though, we don't need to worry too much about the details of interpretation, which have to do with what the coefficient actually means. The other thing I wanted to highlight for you is that this is an example of a study that had different ends different numbers of cases covered in each version of the study that they did. As you can see here, while we got the overall dependent variable, the onset or the beginning of civil war, from the title of the table, each of the models is helpfully labeled with a different version of that dependent variable that was used in this particular study. So they operationalized, they measured civil war differently in each of these five models. Sometimes it's using a different data set. COW refers to a specific data set. 
Sometimes it's saying, hey, we're interested both in civil wars and in wars of um, imperial succession, wars of colonial independence. What then happens is that each of these data sets that were used, or each of these definitions of what a civil or ethnic war is, has a different number of cases associated with it. So you do get variation down here in the overall number of cases studied. To conclude, I'm just going to walk through Table 4 from Thieves 2005, the article that we're reading this week. Here, we'll start by reading the title of the table, The Effect of Interstate and Civil War on the Tax Ratio in Latin America. This is a great title because it's giving you the scope, Latin America, the dependent variable, tax ratio, and the independent variables that they're most interested in, interstate and civil wars. The independent variables, again, are listed here in the first column. You can see interstate war and civil war repeated several times and presented to you as different models. Here we're interested in the coefficient, PCSE. Uh, uh, SE here stands for standard error. So the models are not different columns. The models are the two, two columns that have the coefficients. And the difference between the models is that these used one version, one operationalization of interstate and civil war in the first model, and a different one in the second model. The control variables follow after that. Democracy, debt, GDP per capita, etc. Again, the next thing that we look at is what is statistically significant. And again, the author is using the p-value to demonstrate statistical significance. So any result with stars next to it is statistically significant. What we learned from the first two rows, the first two variables, is that interstate war, according to the definition that Centeno uh, uses, does not have an effect on tax ratio or state development in Latin America. This result is not statistically significant. There's no star. So we can't tell the difference between that and zero. But civil war does have a statistically significant effect, and it's negative. So the more civil wars a country experiences, the lower its tax ratio or state level of state development is going to be. One of the points of these articles, though, is that if you change how you define what an interstate war is, you get different results. So here in this row, where we're using a different definition of what an interstate war is, you can see that interstate war does have a statistically significant effect on the tax ratio in Latin America. And that's basically what I want you to be able to read out of, it, out of these tables at this time.